things of one major the most crucial uh, difference between other animal species and human beings it is language it was a necessity in the evolution for us to evolve uh, this kind of communication system in through which we can talk not just about what is present but also about what is the past and what is yet to come uh, we can talk about distant things. Today I cannot touch my future or experience it. Today I cannot touch my past or experience it. It is language alone that is the bridge between the human consciousness and the rest of the world. So humans are engaging with the world through multitude attitudes and one of them always provides us the turning point, uh, an entry into the future. But if we had only one language, only one way of looking at the world, then damn it, uh, we could as well go to uniforms and we could all eat only the same food cooked in the same factory and be animals once again. History is two things. One is history is the past as it was and the second is an account of that past, a representation of the past, a narrative of that past as it is told. If some narratives decide to look at the essentials, the purities, as again the non-essentials and the impurities in a society, and if such a view decide to think, decides to think of any uh, synthesis in the past, as a matter of an offence, a suffering which deserves to be avenged in the present times, then such an account, historical account, can actually become a weapon or an instrument of torture for people in the present. What happened? Hello everyone. Today we are going to have a dialogue with Dr. Ganesh Devi a linguist, researcher, an activist. Dr. Devi believes that language differentiates human race from other species. It's through language that we are able to connect human consciousness to the world. It's through language that we are able to understand the world from the past and the future a world that's closer to us and easy to see and perceive and the world that's way beyond what we can see. It's through language that we express creativity. Therefore, Dr. Devi is championing the cause of preservation of languages as a means to preserving diversity of cultures, wisdom, and creativity. He established Bhasha Research and Publication Center. He also conducted a survey of Indian languages that revealed existence of 780 spoken languages in India. He also led Dakshinayan, a movement of artists, intellectuals, and concerned citizens were concerned by assassinations of intellectuals and threat to curiosity, democracy, and secularism in India. Let us hear the evolutionary perspective of Dr. Ganesh Devi. So over to Dr. Devi. 
So, hello, Mr. Devi. Um, I'm, I'm excited to have you here. I have had the opportunity to watch several of your interviews on YouTube. And I must say, I am inspired. Uh, also, because there are our curiosity runs parallel. Besides having commitment to social justice and democracy, uh, as I mentioned to you in my email, in my graduate school, I studied uh, communications within that linguistics, anthropology, sociology, psychology and tying it back to all to human imagination and creativity. That was my area of inquiry. And uh, for the last 30 years, I've been traveling around the world, studying people, cultures, and change uh, to inspire innovation. And through that uh, evolution of my curiosity, my methods, my tools, uh, I have come to call myself an ethnographer of social imagination. So you can see there are some parallels and intersections of our curiosity. And um, what I did was, if you, with your permission, I want to share a screen and show you something I did after listening to your uh, videos. So one of the first thing that occurred to me I, while I was listening to this number of uh, presentations by your interviews by you is that your perspective is evolutionary perspective. It and I created a framework in my mind. And so everything that I was learning from your interviews was about evolution from the past to the future, but also with regard to what humans are doing and how their pursuit of discovery of being evolves also. And in that, I started putting down the concepts that you have covered. And I created this slide where... This is my interpretations of ideas and concepts that I was imbibing from everything that you were saying. And these are the things that have formulated my questions for you today. I want to start with something. I want to start with the story that I heard from one of your interviews about the tribals who saved themselves from tsunami. Can you, for the sake of our audience, can you please tell that story and from there, I will begin my questions. Well, uh, when the tsunami hit, uh, the uh, most uh, people in Chennai uh, had a very difficult time. Coastal people all over India, in Sri Lanka, of course. But in the Andamans, the tribe, the Adivasis there, the tribals there, indigenous people there, uh, who have been there for thousands and thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, uh, have languages which uh, allowed them to interpret the movement of waves, the texture, the, 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 uh, the change of folds of waves, uh, directions, uh, the dialogues of waves one with the other. They had language. And that allowed them to uh, figure out that something, uh, something uh, momentous, something terrible was going to happen. And so they went up the hills and all of them were saved. None of them died. None of them, not even one Adivasi died in the tsunami in the Andamans. And, 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 the, and those islands are you know, so uh, tiny, surrounded by the ocean on all sides, uh, they survived. The Adivasis have uh, integrated their consciousness with nature so beautifully for so many thousands and hundreds of years that uh, they understand the language of nature. Uh, whereas uh, someone like me um, uh, likes to look at the meteorology predictions to decide if I should feel happy about the rains to come or worry about the storms to come. And when you say language, it has nothing to do with written language, correct? It's about spoken language. Language is speech. I mean, uh, say, I mean you mentioned uh, Udeji, uh, the evolutionary approach. <clears throat> say Homo sapiens have been using language for the last 70,000 years. 
I mean, if they had not had that language, they would not have stirred out of Africa and gone to other continents, gone to uh, what is uh, Asia, South Asia, uh, all the way to Australia, then crossing Russia into the country where you are United States, 40,000 years ago, 45,000 years ago. Uh, because, because they uh, developed this and they also knew that they could weaponize language. They could use language for defending themselves against attacks. Uh, they could use language for calling out, for mutual help. And in that sense, language was weaponized for security, for advancing. That's what made migration possible. In so, fact, we do not realize it now, but every, uh, whenever anybody anywhere in the world thinks of migrating to another place for work, for education, for leisure, uh, for spiritual pilgrimages, whatever. Uh, we do not realize it, but uh, uh, actually uh, there is need for language to communicate there, a different world, uh, relate to a different world through language. So, uh, lang uh, I mean, the language uh, of the Adivasis uh, that has been uh, uh, very closely linked with nature was verbal. Writing came much later. I mean, the, uh, the maximum we can go back to is the Egyptian writing, Egyptian civilization, or Mesopotamia. It's about five, 6,000 years ago that we got into writing. And writing began not with speech. Uh, scripts emerged because there was need to record a, the memory of complicated transactions, economic transactions. So most scripts began uh, under the pressure of having to create numerals. The humans uh, uh, realize that if they can write numbers, uh, which are numbers uh, normally do not have moods. So numbers also have moods, but numbers normally do not have moods. They're more objective, less subjective. Slowly, humans realize that they can perhaps bring more subjective, emotive issues in um, symbolic marks. And that, that became a script. So th there are, what, about 7,000 languages in the world. There are hardly a few hundred scripts in the world. Most languages, so have, scripts. So I have one question here. So you gave the origin of script. So what was the origin or the need for inventing a spoken language? What was the reason? What was the need for it? Well, the need is internal rather than external. <clears throat> uh, in the uh, process of the evolution of the brain, I mean, Homo sapiens, uh, uh, probably Neanderthals, uh, the Homo erectus, the, and various other uh, animals like uh, us, uh, with a spine, with a spine, uh, which uh, which is erect. Uh, animals uh, whose brains are far removed, farthest from the earth. We are one animal whose brain is removed as much as possible from the earth. Uh, that brain uh, strived and developed a capacity which uh, makes us describe that kind of brain as the recursive brain. And uh, this recursive brain uh, is the brain that thinks about the body, sensory perceptions, uh, but it can also think about thought, think about thinking. And uh, that thinking about thinking, I mean, all other animals, most other animals uh, are aware of their body, body balance, needs such as food, sleep, hunger, I mean, whatever other cravings. Uh, but thinking about their thoughts uh, is uh, there with uh, very few species. Uh, the, you, the Homo sapiens developed this kind of brain. I mean, they did not develop it. Uh, the brain made them homo sapiens, really. Uh, and they realized that they were more intelligent. They could think about thought and they became arrogant. And now they call themselves homo sapiens. <laughs> now, speaking about the thinking about thought, 
uh, enables us to intuit what the other person is going to say. I mean, now I'm going to speak something, but even before I finish half or one third of the sentence, you know where I'm moving. That allows shaping my utterances and your utterances to tune with each other. That's where okay. language takes birth. One quick question. So is empathy based on language also? Language is vehicle for empathy. But empathy uh, has other chemical uh, uh, drives in uh, the body and the brain. Uh, uh, empathy, uh, uh, empathy takes a person out of the, uh, the narcissistic field. Empathy is that moment when I forget myself and think of her or him elsewhere. That's where empathy is. Uh, for the rest of the time, I'm constantly aware of myself in sleep or wakefulness. But when I, my, 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 uh, I stop thinking of myself and think of somebody else, uh, that is the, that is, uh, that moment in the brain, in the brain chemicals, their flows, uh, is of different kind than uh, the intuitive understanding of what the others are going to say or intersubjectivity. In intersubjectivity, the, the, the ego of one and the ego of the other, ego by, by ego, I do not mean ego as we understand popularly, the, uh, the uh, awareness of oneself, uh, not, uh, not uh, uh, boosting about or pride about oneself. The awareness of the self and the awareness of the uh, self, awareness of the self of the other person, they are at the keenest, at the highest. That's when uh, communication can happen. Uh, for if there are, if words are used without that kind of awareness, it is phatic communication. Uh, for instance, uh, whenever I go to office, somebody says hi, good morning, and I say hi, good morning, and I just don't know the face of the person, the name of the person, nothing at all, because that there is no intersubjectivity. It is a social compulsion uh, by which I keep saying yeah, good morning, or uh, in the mass psychology of uh, say mass psychology, when, uh, when workers unions, students unions, or soldiers, uh, th those commands, there is, uh, which they, they, the slogans they shout, uh, uh, Zindabad, Zindabad, uh, Tum Aage Bado, Ham Tumare Saath Hai, etc. There is no self-awareness in that. It is not even fatigue communication. It is the, uh, it is the mass is the mass communication. Uh, sorry, uh, this masscom is used in a very different way. Mm -hmm. I know, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of mass and commun the communication of mass masses, communication of masses. And that's precisely what dictators utilize. Hitler was very shrewd about this. And therefore he said, well, when you're talking to the masses, don't talk intelligently, talk uh, least intelligently because the uh, the uh, intelligence of <laughs> masses is like the lowest common intelligence. Gandhi, on the other hand, wanted everybody to be intuitively tuned, and therefore Gandhi did not speak and yet communicated. In the Hind Swaraj, in the last chapter, when Gandhi gives prescription for Indians of his times, that is 1909. He says, this is the moment for us to repent. If we have remorse for what went wrong in the past, and that remorse need not be just for what I, what wrongs I did, but wrongs that everybody did, but I take responsibility for all of those. And can we move forward uh, eliminating those wrongs? So, uh, that was that was one message. The other message Gandhi was giving was not to lose courage, be courageous, be fearless, be fearless. And yet in that fearlessness, uh, there shouldn't be an iota of violence, revenge, uh, desire to intimidate others. So to be courageous, and to think that whatever has gone wrong in the past, for instance, 
In India, we had the caste system for 3,000 years. Uh, we, we have oppressed women all along. We kept so many people outside education and knowledge. All of those, so many people are uh, filthy rich, and that's a wrong thing. So uh, Gandhi, uh, Gandhi was saying, okay, let's go ahead. Let's all us, all of us be courageous. Let's cross our caste boundary. Let us be tolerant to other religions. Uh, let us not hate even the British, even the British. There's a very uh, interesting <laughs> Uh, sentence, I mean, uh, uh, dialogue there, the conversation there in that Hind Swaraj. And that is, uh, uh, as uh, it is a platonic dialogue, or it is a, like conversation like the Bhagavad Gita, two persons speaking, exchanging opposite views. And uh, one of them is named as editor. So this other person says to the editor, ask, uh, you know, question, ask a question. Uh, but do you not want the British to go Yes, I do. And uh, therefore, if we have weapons like them, we can drive them out. So uh, Gandhi says, then what? You no, know, they will go and then we'll run our own govern government. So Gandhi says, if you want to drive the British with weapons, drive away British with weapons, let them be here because they're using weapons and you will be exactly like them. So you want to drive them away in order to be like them? Don't do it. Don't do it. Gandhi wanted fearlessness. He wanted uh, dhairya and not krauriya. Uh, that, that's not, wonderful. Uh, Thank you for clarifying. So I want to go back to my evolutionary framework and I have a question. Again, in your numerous interviews, you talked about how in the multiplicity of languages in the world and in India resides a knowledge that has been and wisdom that's been transferred for hundreds of thousands of years. And by losing every language, we are losing that wisdom and that knowledge. So my question to you is, how does that long language, that knowledge get transferred? Does it get transferred genetically or does it get uh, transferred by number of words and sentences spoken by one generation to the other through like a word of mouth? How does it get transferred, this hundreds of thousands of years of knowledge? That's a great question. Great question. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful you asked that. Um, when, uh, when I know the world, I as an individual know the world, I know it through my senses. I touch something so I know, I see something, smell something, hear something. My sensory perceptions bring the uh, pehchan, the uh, cognition, the recognition of the phenomenal world surrounding me. When another person like me also grasps, analyzes what is surrounding her or him, and then that person and I start talking about the world that she or he has seen and I have seen, one person has seen, another person has seen or understood experience. Uh, the talk be becomes an, 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 uh, a non-personal, an objective, a non-subjective holder of knowledge that moves from one generation to the next generation. Um, obviously, uh, within families, within close societies, small societies, but after a while, after several generations, when the load of this knowledge, this, this memory becomes larger, then the society starts inventing mnemonics, memory tricks to remember large chunks. When, when I, I was taught the colors in the spectrum. Uh, I uh, my uh, school teacher, my village school teacher in Maharashtra, uh, told me to remember the first letter of the colors: Tamra, Piwra, Hirwa, Tana, He, Nipaza, whatever. But in Marathi, memory trick. 
so uh, large chunks of experiences are associated with uh, either numbers or letters or gestures uh, whatever whatever is or objects in the surroundings various trees various curves of rivers and so on all of that becomes knowledge which is stored memory which is non personal and which can be transacted intergenerationally uh, subsequently of course all this uh, memory load uh, got codified because different memory trick mnemonics developed for various kinds of memories and that that created several ways or of, of remembering the past experiences uh, they they that resulted into conflicting taxonomies the classificatory table in botany was not the same as the classificatory table in chemistry not the same as classificatory table in uh, grammar uh, and so on and so uh, a time came in the, the history of europe as well as in india's history when these different taxonomies had to be reintegrated and that's where leibniz finally succeeded in uh, turning everything into a uh, fragmentable in terms of sequence of zero strings of zero one and so on that final triumph of integrating all memory traditions has been very costly for humans very expensive most expensive in the entire his evolution history of the uh, homo the homo sapiens because this new triumph led us to uh, objectify make non subjective not just our experiences but the but the ability of memory itself and so this string of 0 101 has led us to into developing artificial memory to the extent that today the memory chip has become the worst enemy of natural mind of man when there was a time when i went from kolhapur or you know satara or to uh, let's say delhi or calcutta i would remember telephone numbers of 20 30 friends i don't remember them anymore uh, when i studied in england i remembered every street of the town where my university was because i walked on those streets today the taxi driver belonging to that city does not remember those streets he or she has to depend on the artificial memory which google map or whatever tells him turn left turn right uh, take a u turn and so artificial memory is a, uh, a devastating turn in the history of human languages and, and so uh, why is it devastating because uh, giving to using your example if a driver who is moving say from hubli to dharwad uh, is using gps and if he has a question he uses google search uh, he has access to more information he is able to reach his destination without cognitive overload and attain his objective so where is the problem the problem is uh, the you know there is a town uh, i was i had in my mind when i gave that example where i was studying um, i was invited by my uh, teacher to go and have lunch uh, with his family on sunday and i could not uh, whatever i did i could not locate the house so i asked 10 persons where is where, where does the where does the okwood street you know where is that and where is number 53 or whatever i had 10 conversations i had a different kind of human community in those conversations because i could understand that here was a yorkshire english fellow and the next time the lady i met was an italian widow who had moved to yorkshire uh my world expanded uh, when i use the google map it is very useful but the google map shrinks my world because i look either at the uh, the you know the glass 
of my car with I look blankly with blank uh, or blank gaze or at the Google map. Uh, so in more information, uh, uh, I wish more information uh, was synonymous with greater knowledge. So the serendipitous discoveries that happen by being in the real world are being compromised is what you're saying. Absolutely. I mean, I, I used to go to libraries, large libraries with lakhs of books in different universities. And uh, I uh, invariably went to the books I was not looking for, but some surprising and then pull it out and start reading and losing myself in that book. I, I, I If I went looking for literary criticism, I uh, ended up reading some book of geography or sometimes of physics. Uh, now, uh, unless somebody pushes it down my throat, forwards it, or sends a message, sends a post, or um, uh, I, I don't, I don't get anything but the uh, specialist list of my own subject. I get it. So I have a new question. <clears throat> I want to go back to that tribal in Andaman who had language to understand nuances of ocean's behavior. I also heard in another talk you gave that somebody in Himalayas has a hundred words to understand snow or mountains. So these two people in two different languages understand nature in two different ways in, and they do both don't have each other's knowledge. So what is the cum what is the cumulative effect on the society when these capsules of knowledge reside live in different languages uh, in different parts of the geography? Is there a cumulative effect and is there a way for this diverse population to benefit from this cumulative knowledge? Yeah, I look at both of these individuals as those individuals in their habitats. And uh, I, uh, if the two of them uh, want to be benefited by each other's knowledge, there would be ways. Because in the, in the very uh, ancient past, when this is, I'm speaking of times before Holocene, uh, humans could walk, travel uh, thousands of kilometers and go to another, from desert, they've gone to uh, the Himalayas, they've gone to oceans, Across oceans, so the quest, the the quest for knowledge, is one thing, but the the expectation that these two should be necessarily uh, be part of a continuum of connect connected network of knowledge is uh, my desire, not their desire, and I respect their desire. Absolutely. Uh, Buddha traveled so, so much distance, yes. driven, I think, more by his curiosity than his desire to spread knowledge. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And I'm assuming that there wasn't just one Buddha in the world. Every individual in the ancient civilization was a Buddha traveling hundreds of kilometers in search of their truth. So many, so, so many of them, yes. And uh, uh, Buddha himself said that to his uh, Subhuti, uh, uh, just a few hours before he died, uh, when the Buddha asked, uh, "Did you uh, did you uh, did you understand what I was uh, preaching? And uh, will you be able to tell other people?" And Subhuti says, "Yes, my Lord, I do, and I will say precisely the same words." Actually, uh, Buddha scolded him, and he said, the, "If you want to." repeat my words, then that is not my teaching. You will have to invent your words. Your teaching will become my teaching, not my teaching becoming your teaching. Everybody is one's own Buddha uh, because the journeys are, journeys are endless journeys, there's journey in the mind. And it's not, it's not just a person is traveling, uh, I mean, journey in the mind, journey in time, journey in space, all of those uh, we uh, we continuously undertake and we're in the middle of a journey all the time even when seated we're in the uh, if we don't notice the earth is uh, moving us actually like merry-go-round uh, nothing is steady and is constant moving and that moving is steady 
that's what i'm saying uh, but uh, not just us moving but probably our sales our eyes our ears are on different journeys okay so another question i have because i'm very curious about this trans generational transfer of wisdom and knowledge and consciousness uh, i don't know if you read uh, rupert sheldrake so he yeah. talks about uh, morphic resonance hmm. do you have any thoughts on that no do you believe that knowledge gets transferred from species amongst all species from generation to generation by through genetic transfer of knowledge also uh i don't uh, uh, i don't uh, think so the the uh, i mean if i did that uh i would dec be declaring myself as a staunch advocate of caste i don't think that happens i don't think that happens uh yes genes get transferred and genes have genes have a record of what the body has suffered or experience in the past but that is that is not uh, that is not a knowledge of a kind but it is the habit of conducting oneself mm -hmm. uh, it is it is like uh, when i walk on bombay streets uh, during the early monsoon i do not walk on pavements uh because i know that uh, there could be a a, a drainage uh, you know, a opening there to avoid that i would. so that is i conduct myself with safety the genes know how to keep the body safe okay and for okay. that purpose whatever is necessary the 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 the, the equipment for survival is embedded in genes but knowledge is not about one's own body would the genes know uh, how uh, kind or how unkind the neighbors of my father were in which case i have another question uh, richard donkey is, is, is a social product so not a physical product physiological so product. I, i have a question richard dawkins who himself is a biologist proposed the idea of memetics yeah where he says memes uh, are parallel to genes to the world of culture and ideas and they also have a property of self a survival through self replication do you subscribe to that theory no why it's very good theory as theory it's very good uh, knowledge produced has a short life produced by human societies has a short life independent of that society but if that society were to perish that knowledge won't remain there uh, so uh, so it it is it is like a i mean uh, the, the english term is tops bhaura that we play with it we throw it out and it is rotating uh, but that rotation is not forever the control is in the body movements of uh, or a cricket ball a cricket ball thrown from one end of the pitch to the to another uh, will move of course uh, but uh, it won't re return by itself to the bowler for a, and won't throw itself for a second throw even if there are marks marks of the first throw on the surface of the uh, these these memes my, of course there is a the mimetic theory which is of greek origin uh, where they believed that uh, the ideas uh, have an existence uh, not ideas as i understand them but things that do not die ideas uh in the uh, in the in a world which is above our world because they believed that that was perpetually filled with light ours was half light half shadow and there was a third one which was full of darkness only only darkness darkness and light mixed for us 
in our case, uh, bringing shadows like this of my chainlands. Uh, there up, up uh, in the, in the uh, uh, superior, what the Greeks considered superior world, because there was no darkness, there was no shadow, and therefore everything there was forever, no need to recreate it, and therefore it was an idea. For the Greeks, and the humans were miming those ideas, and therefore they became mimetic. Okay. Mime, in that sense. Right. So this theory that you mentioned is the mimetic theory, the mimetic theory, then uh, is being discussed for the for the universe of humans or other humans plus other species, and not for the universe of humans, gods, demons. I get it. In the universe of humans. In the universe of knowing brains, knowledge is a social product which has a life of its own, objective life of its own, only so long as that society remains there. I mean, I, I refuse to believe that uh, uh, when we enter, humans enter into uh, the, uh, the virtual world uh, and uh, they, uh, they start living not through cells, but through digits only. And uh, where real space uh, uh, and real time collapse into some kind of you know, uh, time and space that we can manage at, at, uh, by, through a remote, through a mouse. I don't believe that what the bodily humans have gathered as knowledge will survive beyond a point in time. It will survive for a while, just as uh, somebody walks past you and wears fragrance. But the fragrance lingers, but it cannot be perpetually there. So I have a philosophical question. Uh, if I take a whole evolutionary process since the Big Bang, humans have been in existence only for very a very short small, time. small part of the universe's existence. Tiny part. Yes, indeed. So a very all, tiny. So all the language, all the knowledge that is being created by human language, is it only for the benefit of human existence? Or does it have any utility beyond the time when humans become extinct? Who succeed humans is the question. Is it homo deus, that is well-intentioned humans, or hum or, or the sp this species that succeeds us, uh, somewhat like us, partly made of chips, partly made of bones, uh, whether uh, that is looking at colonization of the space in an aggressive way, uh, leaving the Earth behind as a charred, completely charred planet, or or whether uh, this new uh, new age humans uh, want uh, all species to survive and go forward collectively together. So it whether that knowledge will survive or not depends on. What kind of species is to follow? Do other if it, sorry. If it is a species that cares, hmm. then knowledge will be taken forward. New means of taking this knowledge forward will be invented. Today, if, today do invent other species have interest in the knowledge humans have accumulated? They have interest. Uh, uh, it's a it's a rather uh, pitiable situation that the young ones of the humans, human species, unlike the young ones of elephants or uh, cubs, or tiger cubs, or you know, young ones of other species, uh, you uh, the young ones of human species in are invariably pushed into schools, colleges, and universities, even in order just to become citizens, they need to go through this uh, entire. A rigorous process of socialization 
by going to those who refuse to go to schools they are they are uh, even under the garb of kindness they are put through the um, uh, punishment of uh, different schools different schools uh, that is uh, i am saying that the young ones of the human species uh, spend uh, nearly 15 20 years in trying to learn what knowledge previous generations have gathered however when they grow up they go uh, as citizens they start voting uh, they start supporting this or that party uh, they find that uh, all these states all the states uh, are uh, interested in aggression suppression and destruction control not freedom and so what the life they start with so much hope uh, that uh, meets with a a kind of either self deception when some of them join the state quite gleefully or uh, that uh, childhood dream shatters and then people become loners they become uh, Uh, they become uh, they turn to uh, false spirituality religions uh, they turn to blind faith in all kinds of tricks uh, and uh, the worst of all the worst of all they go to the insurance agency trying to believe trying to pretend that somehow death can be stopped Uh, if death happens it is unnatural and so on there is a there is a, a fascinating uh, 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 belgian uh, philosopher who came out two years back uh, with a book called the mass psychology of totalitarian totalitarian state and he uh, oh i i will show you that book to you the uh, uh, matthias waspet is the name and he says uh, since people are all buying insurance not just of their life but their cars their houses their books their journeys their baggage their dogs their pets even insurance of insurance now uh, such people uh, because they become so security minded they start obeying the state which pretends to make rules regulations promising people order mm-hmm. and in the process totalitarian state emerges so uh, your question about knowledge knowledge is knowledge if it opens up human societies sa vidyaya vimukta you know the one who has got knowledge should experience freedom if knowledge can take us to greater freedom it is knowledge if it cannot take us to greater freedom it is not knowledge the uh, question about you know you, uh, you will easily say uh, i imagine that look your choices will be so many in the virtual world there is no unlimited choices of space time <clears throat> what format you want to be uh, how old you want to be how for how long you want to live how you travel everything absolutely limitless but limitlessness is not freedom not having limits is not freedom freedom is an enlightened state of mind when the ego subsides and one enters in the empathy mode one enters in the silence of mahatma gandhi or the sacrifice of jesus christ that is freedom jesus i mean their hands uh, the, 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 i mean his hands his legs were tied his hands were nailed but he is the one who will bring freedom i am not saying he will bring freedom to it i am not not like a preacher but the idea or the, or uh, or the or socrates who who speaks of freedom in death gandhi speaks of freedom in surrender surrender not not surrender to aggression 
Absolutely. So I have one question. I'm now going to, we talked in the entire evolutionary spectrum, but now I want to come closer to the reality. Uh, in some of your, oh, that's beautiful. Uh, I'm the, going to take that. I'm going to order that. Yeah, my case was great. I mean, it's it's a uh, he's a young man, not written with great maturity, but he his uh, thesis is fantastic, uh, okay. and it is written uh, under the observation of Corona. Got it. So I have a question here. Um, let me just frame the question uh, because there are too many facets to it. While you're framing the question, may I have your permission to read out a little paragraph? Absolutely. <clears throat> my life has been, this is me. Mm. My life has been lived through my eyes, not so much through the ears, the ears, uh, uh, or touch and taste. So very often, even before the person in front of me has started the conversation, said what is to be said, what is to be concealed, tried the artful deceit, or effusively claimed a non-existent momentary kinship, or just plainly placed facts, inquiries, and questions before me, my eyes seem to grasp it all, or almost all, before words frame those thoughts and convey them to me. So very often, my colleagues and friends tell me how greatly intuitive I am, which I am not. It is just that my eyes work a wee bit faster than the rest of my cognition. They grasp things faster than my mind does. When I was younger, I would occasionally look at my eyes in mirrors and try to see what color they were. I was not, it was not easy for me to decide if they were dark, light, or some shade in between. I recall that such moments of looking at my eyes made me, uh, for those moments, quite empty. My mind would cease to register anything at all, including the act of my looking. I no longer have a clear memory of that experience, for I am now at an age when I can hardly see my eyes or myself in mirror images with any clarity, except occasionally in the Con concave mirrors of hotel bathrooms or in the side view mirror of my car when I drive. I no longer have much idea of what color they are. I do not really know what they are like. I have known the world through a part of me that I used to know uncertainly when I was young and no longer know except in rare moments of self-examination. And therefore I like my greatest heroes are Homer, Surdas, and Milton. All three of them were blind. Yeah, and then of course, Beethoven wrote his final symphony when he was deaf. Yes. So this is beautiful. Actually, yeah. can I say something? Yeah. A lot of what you said, except the last two, three sentences, I almost felt it was my experience as well. Please tell me. Yes. No. So, so no, this is this is how I feel. It's funny when I'm sitting at a restaurant and talking, observe somebody, and I ask them questions about, like once it happened, there was somebody sitting next to me, and I asked him if he was a musician, and it felt like he was getting ready for an exam, and he said, "How did you know I am a musician and I have an audition this evening?" And I have no idea how, but it is my just observation that made me, and this has happened repeatedly to me, and I do not have intuition, but I don't know what tells me that. That's the truth of language. That's the truth of language. That is true language. Language is not of words. <laughs> and uh, about the, you know, the evolutionary thing, in future, humans are looking forward to grasping the world through images more than through words. But uh, even that could be a, a chimera uh, because what humans have done to words, they will eventually do to uh, images as well if they continue to be humans as they are. Well, wonderful. So now I remember the framing of my last mm -hmm. next question is, so 
in many of your uh, conversations, uh, is this okay? If, uh, we just spend another five ten minutes. I'm I'm comfortable. Uh, I feel very happy uh, having this conversation. Thank you. So my question is: in many of your interviews, you have cited Rigvedas and different Vedas and the knowledge that was embedded in it. How is your curiosity for the Vedas or ancient scriptures different from the Hindutvavadi's interest in Vedas and scriptures? Uh, may I tell you a little story, yes. anecdote? I went to teach, uh, I went to Baroda city to teach hmm. when I was 30. I was at the university. And uh, it was a great place, uh, considered great in those days. Uh, many great people had worked there in the past. But uh, it had, the campus had become very noisy. So I made a request to the librarian to give me a room, uh, which, was, uh, which was accepted. And then the librarian also said, over kind person, uh, which of books you want, you pull them to your room and you know feel free to. That library had a huge amount of work on Sanskrit. So left, right, center, I pulled out books on Upanishads, on you know grammar, on the aesthetics, uh, plays, and so on. And uh, I started reading and enjoying. My curiosity in the Sanskrit language was because of, because of a paradox that I noticed. And that is, uh, while Sanskrit was so overvalued at that time, had such great literature, uh, and yet there were people uh, whose languages were dying because in the same library I saw uh, the, uh, the statistics of census. And I noticed that so many names of so many languages are being concealed by the government. So I was one. I, I actually, I sitting there in that library room filled with books, uh, mostly Sanskrit, uh, ancient literature, and so on. I was thinking about what the situation would have been when Sanskrit arrived from the European steppes. And uh, it had uh, it had an encounter with other languages in India, Dravidic, Pali, pra what became Pali uh, later or Prakruts later. Uh, what conversation was carried out between the Vedic uh, nomadic uh, tribes and the uh, settled uh, people in India who had learned agriculture by then, because agriculture had come into India. Uh, at least 1500 years before the Veda uh, started getting composed, what would have been the con conversation in which language and so on? So that curiosity the, um, uh, was there. Uh, it started looking like a paradox in my time because here I was looking at ancient books, books printed about ancient literature and in the surrounding area, not very far from Baroda, 50 kilometers outside the city, there were tribes and tribes and tribes, uh, about one fifth of, uh, no, 14% of Gujarat's population was tribal population. Their languages were dying. I knew that. So this paradox uh, uh, completely shattered me. I was uh, caught between these two uh, worlds. Should I follow? Sanskrit and the great tradition of literature, or should I go out in the field and look at the people and figure out how to uh, how to uh, tackle that language situation of their languages dying under pressure? I think uh, my thoughts and action were born out of it. And you think. Uh the current ideologues don't have that curiosity. They would claim they do. Current ideologues. The Hindu Tovadis. The current ideologues. Uh, 
suddenly uh, great ideas surface in history. I mean, the uh, second half of the 19th century, great people, Tagore, Gandhi, Ambedkar came subsequently, Aurobindo Ghosh. I mean, so many, so many of them were born, second half of the 19th century. Uh, there are times when uh, not so great people get born. Uh, I, I mean, superstitiously or for historical convenience, one can use the term Yuga Dharma, the nature of an era. Uh, so the current Yuga, the current era, uh, is of people who are moving knowledge as if it is furniture. The knowledge policies are no different from furniture rearrangement or furniture break, breaking, actually, lock breaking. Uh, their attitude to Sanskrit is not attitude to Sanskrit, but Sanskrit is furniture in their view of the past, which, which helps them in proving I mean, they, they use this furniture to prove that the Aryans were there first, then came the others. They brought decline of Indians, uh, which allowed Indians to fall in the hands of the British. And now here they are to go back to Sanskrit, to Arya Dharma, the uh, the and uh, Sanatan Dharma and uh, punish those who, in their perceived view of the past, have uh, have uh, inflicted injury on India. Now that that attitude is not an attitude to knowledge. It is not even a utilitarian attitude to knowledge. It is actually if, 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 if they think of knowledge as goods, as furniture, which can be used. Furniture does not have a life of its own. Though I believe you, I mean, even they, every chair has its swabhava, its nature. Uh, but uh, in this case, the idea of so the, the Hindutva idea of Sanskrit and the past is an idea which is fitted into a convenient narrative of history and not, not a narrative of history based on what the facts of that past were. And that narrative does not inspire curiosity, imagination, or the freedom that Gandhi thought of. Yeah, that narrative inspires hate, disdain, anger, revenge. And these are the things Gandhi said make you less than human. There is one more thing. Gandhi said that uh, non-violence, violence is born out of greed. And non-violence is Possible if you learn a parigraha. Pari means hand, palm, grahan karna to hold with you. So if when you learn not to grab and hold, then alone you can be, you will understand the meaning of ahimsa. This uh, this grabbing, go get grab, because you feel deprived of power, um, and uh, so, and in order to grab power, keep that power. Uh, use any means, uh, use the past as furniture to be shuffled around, forget about the facts of the past, uh, so social classes to be shuffled around through social engineering, forget about what human relations people have built over centuries. Uh, that is how the, uh, I mean, you said ideologues, and uh, just a few minutes back, we were discussing uh, the Greek idea of ideas. And I had mentioned Socrates. So Socrates understood idea very differently than 
uh, uh, then these people understand idea and therefore even to describe them as ideologues is uh, uh, an adventure. <laughs> I have one last question. Please. Uh, my purpose of doing this series of dialogues is to preserve the ethos of the times in which I grew up, in which my parents inherited the ideas of various freedom fighters, Gandhi, Buddha, Ambedkar, Rabindranath Tagore, all the people that you were talking about. And just as you said, there is this the, the current yuga has a different yuga dharma. And my attempt is to preserve the memory of that ethos for the next generation so that they can take it and take it wherever they want to with at least preserving the moral dharma that was defining that era. So what is your message to these youngsters I am addressing through this program? What would you tell them? taking all the knowledge and wisdom you have gained from these hundreds of years of our legacy of language, what would you tell them? Well, I have no, no message, no message, but uh, I, can, uh, I can say this much. Uh, learn to surrender yourself uh, and make yourself fit enough to inherit the great wisdom of the past. Uh, Tagore had spoken of true education as that peculiar moment in which the mind starts experiencing freedom. And he did not ascribe it to teachers and so on. So experiencing that moment of freedom, they, in uh, Buddhism, there is this concept of samvega. Samvega is the moment and Anand Kumar Swami has written beautifully about Samvega. Samvega is the moment when the intellect becomes fluid and starts moving. Empathy begins, compassion begins. Karuna begins. Karuna in the deepest sense begins. But for that one has to make oneself fit through by surrendering oneself to life uh, its rhythms, uh, its uh, its wounds, hurts, and also its uh, triumphs and glorious moments. To live naturally, to live naturally, might be one way, a great way of not allowing the artificial life which is coming ahead of us to take hold of the human societies. Thank you so much. This was so beautiful. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just one. Just one thing I wanted to add. Have you heard of, uh, have you not heard of Rashtra Sevadar? I, I, I am made from Rashtra Sevadar. I was the national president of Rashtra Sevadar and I was hoping that you, for three years, I was I, hoping I, you were talking about Sane Guruji. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. In fact, I was just going to say everything that you said is a message of Sane Guruji. Uh, I, I don't know if you know, but my mother of course, of course. Why would I not know this? No, no, know no, this. no. No, let me no. tell you. From the yeah. day Sane Guruji died, every Sunday she observed a fast in his memory until her death. So, so she died in 2001. So from the day Sane Guruji passed away till her death, every Sunday evening she did not eat anything in his memory. So I've heard of Sanigriji. I've read Shamchi Ai so many times. And everything that you said is embodied in what... Actually, I was going to ask you that question. I said, <laughs> when you embrace all of these qualities, the only name that comes to my mind is Sane Guruji. But what it did to him is 
it brought him in in conflict with in pain with his surroundings and he decided to end his life yes it was sad it was beautiful it was sad it was a great great death uh, and this is what is the proof of what you said you and i have never met but our consciousness lives in the same space our curiosity lives in the same space our imagination lives in the same space thank you very much and good night thank you for your time